Hey everyone, welcome to Founders Live Conversations. I am Nick Hughes, I'm the founder and CEO of Founders Live. And I'm so excited today to have a special guest with us. We have Elizabeth Arnold, who is uh, founder and CEO of Flip App, joining us from Ventura, California. And you know, this is just an amazing opportunity. We're talking with our global Founders Live Primetime 2023 winner. And Elizabeth, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. It's good to be to be back here again. It's awesome. I'm so excited. And, you know, we've been able to uh, chat and get to know each other a little bit. And so we know a little bit your story. And then from your opportunities through the Primetime Pitch Challenge, plus our Primetime Global, you know, uh, the whole Primetime experience the live stream competitions we've heard your story we've seen you pitch online and it's been great but what we want to do first is to get to know you a little bit and hear a bit more about you know just a bit of background on yourself and then we're going to get into your entrepreneurial journey and then also what you're building yeah I can totally do that um so just a little bit about me kind of yeah, generally know about me all right well, um, originally, I'm actually from Michigan. I do live in California now. Uh, I kind of split my time between Tahoe and Ventura. So I'm, I'm super lucky to be able to do that. Um, and it works great for Flip because they're both very active communities, which we'll get into later. Um, but yeah, you know, I went to a small college, I graduated, I moved to Costa Rica, did a bunch of crazy stuff in Costa Rica, bought and or basically built and sold a hotel, came back to the States and have been in marketing ever since. And and just flip over to flip. So that's really high level who I am, <laughs> what I'm working on. Well, awesome. Awesome. Um, and it's uh, so great to uh, have you a part of, you know, Founders Live and hear your story. And, um, you know, and I know that there is an amazing story that you discovered, like this issue and problem in this world. But before we get to that, I really love to hear a little bit more about, you know, look, this is Founders Live. We talk about entrepreneurship and you're you're a very capable person. You're um, sharp and knowledgeable. Why not just go go work for a corporation, um, get that nice paycheck? But no, you've chosen entrepreneurship and you've chosen to be a founder, which is not easy. It's literally mm -hmm. self-discovery in the moment. Why yeah. choose entrepreneurship? Why start a company? Yeah, um, we talked about this a little bit ourselves, but I think it's kind of like a, it's like a personality trait. Um, I, I think I, it's definitely not for everyone. It is not super easy. Um, but even in college, you know, I ended up taking this random class in business school, and it was just entrepreneurship. That's it. That's all the class is called. And I was like, I don't even know what that means. And so I just hopped into this class, um, and I ended up being part of a team where we created our own uh, computer repair service for the campus. And then we actually ran that um, for a couple of years before we graduated um, and then gave it back to the school. It was kind of part of this whole entrepreneurship program. So it kind of got me into like, well, hey, like you really can build something on your own um, and meet these really cool people that are doing it. And so ever since then, I've kind of had like side companies as well, like a woodworking business and like a yoga travel agency and a hotel in Costa Rica. And so I've always had these small businesses that I've built and sold on the side and i think it's just part of my personality is like i'm never really just satisfied doing like just one thing um so i've always had these other little businesses going to to keep me honestly learning all the time it's constant learning journey i'm always figuring out something new using yeah. the talents that i currently have to evolve um, so it's just this constant constant space i'm in what do you think is the most maybe beneficial or um great thing about founders or about entrepreneurship in general um what what does it give to you that maybe a traditional career as an employee wouldn't yeah well i've done both i've worked for you know some big companies um some big agencies and some smaller ones as well um but as much as i love the people that i've worked with at those companies what I get out of entrepreneurship is this like community. Um, and that sounds really cliche, I'm sure, but you really do like, there's people I met when I first started this, um, that if I had never met them, I would not be where I was. Um, they are, entrepreneurs are so willing to help each other out. They're willing to make the connections, to 
listen to you when you've had a really crazy week um, and then they understand what it's like to try and build something and oh hey like I have a developer that would be good for you and just that community is so so beneficial and it's amazing like I've made some of my best friends by being an entrepreneur um, and it's just worked out really well that way for me so I, I love it. Yeah, community, obviously. And, and that's, you know, why we have Founders Live and, you know, why mm -hmm. we built this, you know, uh, in, incredible experience around the world. And um, what would you say, last point on really just the entrepreneurial path is, um, how would you sum up, you know, how is it to you most challenging? Being an entrepreneur? Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. Um, there's so many challenges. It's an emotional roller coaster. Within the same hour, you can be just like super high. Everything's amazing. I got this. And then 20 minutes later, you're like, what just happened? The world is failing. What am I doing? Oh my God. Um, so I think just the emotional roller coaster can be a lot. It can be very trying. Um, I'm also, I'm a non tech founder building a tech product. So my personal challenge in my entrepreneur journey is always trying to answer and solve those tech problems without having that knowledge. So I'm I'm constantly learning and growing in that way too. And it's, it's difficult, but you do, you get the support, which is nice. You know, I, I wrote a blog post years ago and uh, the kind of ups and downs of entrepreneurship and <clears throat> the image that I used was, uh, this roller coaster, like, <laughs> that, and you just described yeah. it, you just described it. And, you know, everyone out there watching just know, it is that it is normal, actually. And, you know, we're not here to mm -hmm. scare anyone. We're here to tell them the truth and the, you know, being very authentic about what the experience is. And it's ups and downs. Like you wake up and some days you're like, oh, I'm like, you're like, this is the coolest thing. And then the, like three hours later, you're like, oh, my God. <laughs> and you yeah. have to be, you got to get used to that. Right. You do. And it's not, you know, you read stuff on, on LinkedIn and on YouTube channels. If you're following you know, companies like Y Combinator and their founder stories, and it's all amazing. And you're like, yeah, like I built this product out of grad school and I'm just like, you know, a billionaire now. And that's great. And that's 100% like exactly where they probably are in their life right now. But the day to day they don't go into, it's really like, it can be emotional um, and it's, it's a lot. So it's good to have that network. If you have a co-founder or a business partner, like it's great to have them too, because they can take some of that load off and they can ride the highs with you and they can ride the lows. And it's, um, it's nice to have that. Awesome. Well, what we want to do is get a little bit of your experience with, you know, the founders live uh, prime time, the entire competition. And, and really let, let's start with, you know, you participated in the prime time pitch challenge. That's mm -hmm. really, that was your entry into our, really our ecosystem and, and, you know, our world. So first question is, you know, why, why should any startup founder, especially in the early stage, choose to engage with the pitch challenge? Like why do the pitch challenge and why did you and your co-founder choose to jump in to take that pitch challenge? Yeah. So for us, it worked out really well. Um, me and my and my partner, my business partner is like, we don't live in the same um, area. One of them doesn't even live in the same state. So it can be really difficult to get together for a live pitch challenge. And so doing something that was online was really appealing. And there's not a ton of opportunities for that, that I was coming across, at least during that time. So the pitch challenge for Founders Live was really appealing because we could just submit something online and then be a part of this, you know, remote way to to get the word out and, and be part of that ecosystem. So that was really appealing. And at the same time, it required a video. And if there's one thing that my business partner knows how to do, it's like literally making bomb videos. Um, so she's been great at that. So I was like, hey, all we have to do is make this video. And then we submit it. And then we just get people to vote for it. Like I like, there was no doubt in my mind that we could achieve that goal at least. And so just the barrier to entry for us and the way that our business works um, was really low for Founders Live. And so it was a great way for us to step in and just do that. We have a really big ecosystem on social um, and we, we like making videos. So it worked out really well. Well, you did excellent. I can tell you that. And, you know, for you all watching and just if you're thinking about participating in the pitch challenge and like, Hey, is that something first and foremost, you know, what, what they experienced here was, you know, they looked at it and said, Oh, this is a, you know, let's take this little challenge. It's going to really benefit us. But also you have the opportunity to create that video and 
the video really is a, a message that you're putting out. What is our 99 second pitch? If we were going to put a, a you know something together that encapsulates what we do, allows us to share it to the market and the world, and then there's also a kind of a challenge and a competition around it. Yeah. So that's that that was what you did and it was awesome and and so you you both did really well and I was very impressed with personally like the moment I saw that video that you'd created I was like this is it this is great <laughs> and it's a good example of uh, being able to put together your message and tell a little quick story and put it out in the world and and then get people to take action and and you did it so congratulations Thanks. And it was fun too. like pitch competitions are usually like, not only are they usually longer than 99 seconds, but the 99 seconds made you really have to curate your story. Like what's the problem you're solving? How are you solving it? Who are you solving it for? And like, that's it. That's basically all you have time for. So to be able to really hone in with you and your team on like, what are we building is really important. And then just having fun with it. Like we didn't have to just flip through a pitch deck and be like, this is the problem. This is a solution. This is the product, blah, blah, blah. Like we got to be interactive with each other. We got to be interactive with the audience that we're, we're going for. And so we got to have a lot of fun with it. Um, and you know, you can't usually act out your business on stage. So doing that in a video was, was pretty fun. Well, and that's what we're doing. Everyone is whether it's a forcing function or not, these are the things that if you choose to do this, uh, you don't need the pitch challenge. It's nice that we have it, but it is a really good thing for, uh, especially early stage companies and startups. It, it kind of helps you feel like there's something more here and you're able to professionally put together that video message and put it out and, you know, put some storyline to it, have some fun. What do we do? Like, one of our core values is to have fun, right? And so all of this is there for you all to take steps forward and really good things come from it. Really good things. And speaking of that, you know, we would love to hear a bit more of a, your experience, you know, pitching and winning Founders Eye Primetime in 2023. So you went from the pitch challenge and you won that. That was like essentially a virtual uh, week long, maybe two weeks long pitch you know, challenge online. And then you won the opportunity to go into primetime, our Founders Eye primetime global competition representing uh, North America. And you were able to uh, walk through that. And by the end, you were the one startup that was remaining that received the most votes during the experience. Just a little bit of your, just, you know, a bit of your experience, you know, what was it like? And then that was a live pitch versus, you know, the previous pitch challenge was more like a recorded video. So those are a bit different. So uh, how was the experience and maybe your takeaways from it? Yeah. So for the original video, like my personal whole goal was like, I was like, we're going to get to this mark where I can then sit down and have a chat with Nick, because that was like one of the things, if you get enough votes, like you get to chat with Nick. And I was like, dope. Like, I want to talk to this guy. So um, we did that. That was really cool. And when we, we made it through, we had to do the live pitch. Um, and you know, it was, it was a lot of marketing curation to try and figure out what the timing is so that we could invite everybody that we could across our social networks, our wait lists, you know, the partners that we have and just get them really interested in attending a live recorded version of us pitching just for 99 seconds. And then basically taking that video and putting it into more like a slide deck and just saying like in 99 seconds, this is pretty much summing up the video that we did before, like, will you vote for us? And so it was a lot of marketing and it was really cool to be able to curate your audience that way. Um, like you don't get a lot of opportunities to just be like, let's do this all together. And so we, we really had to rally everybody. Um, and that was really fun. It's a cool opportunity. And it's one of those roller coaster highs where like all of a sudden people start logging on and you like see these comments start coming through and you're like, go flip and you know, go the other teams. And I'm like, Oh my God, I was like, there's like a lot of people here. Um, so it was, it was actually a lot of fun. Well, good. Yeah. You, you know, again, you did a great job and, um, you know, we, we kind of see this, we go from like more of an edited, you know, professionally put together, took some time to put that together video to now we're live, we're, we're on screen, mm -hmm. you're flipping through slides and, you know, for, for others listening as well, you know, founders live, we have physical events literally in cities across the world. And those are, you stand up on stage, there could be, you know, 150, 200 people in the room and you got to, 
pitch and you got your 99 second pitch there and you have to stay confident. Um, this was more of uh, in front of screen, but there was hundreds of, you know, there was a lot of people, a lot of people watching at one time online and, and you did a, a great job there and walking through that. And, and I think in the end, you know, by going through these exercises, it really does help all of us look in the mirror and say, what is the core of our message? Right. And we're going to get to that with flip very quickly, but, you know, make one tip quickly for those that uh, are looking to do in the future. They're like, okay, we want to do this founders live thing. I want to do a pitch. Um, you know, what was maybe one tip as you went through this, both recording and then actually in live, whether it was preparation or in the moment, anything come to mind that you want to share with people that you found worked for you in your confidence, maybe staying calm and all of that? Um, practice, <laughs> definitely practice. I have, I have so many pitch decks um, just in my Canva. I have a whole folder. It's got like a million pitch decks in it. They're all edited for different things over time. And so basically I took one of my shorter ones and I shortened it even more for the 99 second one and, and looked back and forth at the video. And then I practiced it and I practiced it and I practiced it on a timer to make sure that I was always at or just below 99 seconds. Um, and then practice in front of your mentors, like ask somebody to hop on a half hour phone call, be like, Hey, I've got a 99 second pitch. Can I pitch this to you? And you can give me feedback before I go live. And I did that to a few people. Um, and it was just really helpful because they also gave me feedback. Like, that doesn't make sense. And it's because you're cutting it down so short, you need to really hone in very directly on that message. So practicing is going to be really helpful. And then when you're running through it, it's just kind of like on autopilot as you're just going through um, and pitching live. Yeah, that's great. You know, practice, um, you know, hey, some people out there, <clears throat> you might be one that you just need that repetition and you need it in some ways almost, uh, you know, memorize it. And then some, it's okay in terms of not memorizing it and you just know your talking points. But whatever it is for you all, what she's saying is absolutely practice so that you feel comfortable in the, the space and the environment, the time limit. You know, if it's a physical event, maybe it's even uh, imagining that setting, standing in that setting. If you can have access even before the, the event starts, you know, all of those things are preparation to help you feel confident and comfortable. And um, you did a great job, Elizabeth. So there you go. Yeah, thanks. It was fun. It was it was a good time. Awesome. Well, let's transition into Flip. And, you know, when, you know, first of all, what's Flip? Well, find local individual players. So talk to us about, you know, how Flip app connects users based on sports and hobbies and interests, finding local individual players. And the way that we want to start this is, you know, there there's, there's a little story here in some senses that maybe walk us through how you discovered in the world a problem that you really want to solve. Yeah. Um, so I, when I moved back from living in Costa Rica, I went back to the place I was living in Michigan. And I just realized that the people that I had been friends with you know, four or five years prior that I left just weren't my kind of people anymore. Um, you know, I had changed, I was a different person and I came back and I wanted to basically be more active. And so at the time I was like, cool, like I wanna find somebody to play tennis with, like I need to make new friends. And so I went on meetup.com um, and that was an unfortunate circumstance. I was catfished by somebody that said that they were like a 20 something year old girl to go play tennis with. And I was really fortunate those circumstances can get super out of hand and really scary. And so I was fortunate that I could just walk away from the situation. but. At the same time, I was like, this isn't safe and it's not fun. Like I no longer want to go and try this platform to go do this one thing. Like it just didn't make me comfortable anymore, especially as a female. And so then I tried Facebook groups. So it was the other option out there and you're just ghosted all the time. It's great for advice. It's not really good for the actual physical meeting up of it. Um, and so I just thought to myself, like there has to be a better way to do this. And then I was like, I think I probably sat on that for a few months and I was like, I'm not going to wait for somebody else to build this because they're not going to build it the way that I know it needs to be built. So um, I went out and I did some market research and I just honestly did a survey and I started reaching out to people and I was like, am I the only one that can't find a rock climbing partner? Like, are, are you having problems going scuba diving? Cause like, I can't figure that out either. Um, and a lot of people had the same problems. So I kind of realized this was something that needed to be solved. And I just figured like, well, why not me? Well, you know, and I, 
absolutely can see this challenge and this issue. And it's, I'm glad that you took steps for it, but why do you think it's important for people to connect? And let's get a little deeper here in maybe what you're actually building, but let's start with why did you feel that it's important that people can safely meet and connect with like-minded individuals, especially in, 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 in a city or in their own city? Yeah. So, I mean, there's so many reasons. Loneliness is a really big problem, especially right now. It's been one of the main topics kind of of 2023 and, and still coming out of COVID. I feel like some people are still a little shell-shocked from, from all that had happened. And it's really, really hard to connect with people. And it's so much easier to just sit in front of your TV and like watch Netflix rather than go to the climbing gym because you're like, oh, like my one friend that climbs like just isn't available on Tuesday night. So like, screw it. I'm not going to work out this week. Um, and so the the less that you move, the less that you're active and the less that you connect with people in real life, I mean, it's just going to contribute to that loneliness and that depression and anxiety that we're seeing increasing throughout the years and increasing across generations as well. This isn't just something for millennials or Gen Zers or boomers, like everybody's kind of experienced this across the threshold and connection to people in real life is really important. And in my opinion, if you can utilize technology, which is fabulous, to connect people online so that you can have better and more authentic connections offline, it's going to make a huge difference in your life. And you're just, we're going to try and tip the scale and make people happier rather than just sitting there watching Netflix. This is so important. And yeah, you know, when you look at the effects of the pandemic, um, whether, you know, you, you could even remove the pandemic. And I, I still think this would be important in 2024 if that never even happened. Absolutely. Right. But um, clearly that was, that was some issues, but um, you know, I a hundred percent when you look at, the fact of um, just helping people connect, you know, I think one thing that as people get older in their life, they, you know, it's not like high school or college anymore. You're not colliding with all these people. And so, you know, as people uh, advance in, in their years, they're more needing and looking for quality connections and um, relationships and not, you know, not romantic, just friends, Right. And, mm -hmm. and not all that. And then you can you combine that with uh, actual activity, which I really appreciate is like getting people outside. You know, we, we can see this trend more and more of, you know, the devices that are in our life and the more that we're on the screen. And so uh, if you can get people out active around something um, that is a fun and healthy, all of this is good. OK, this is all good. And so I think you touched uh, one thing I want to talk about because that this does pop up. I'm sure it pops up all the time is the safety thing. And so you take this thing that's really good, healthy. We're connecting people on interests, but there's also these things that you need to put in place to make sure that it's um, safe. And, you know, what sort of thoughts have you put around that? And, and what how do you see this moving forward of making sure that it's used in the right way and that people that your customers and users are taken care of and that they can be safe. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, I mean, the technology is already out there to to do background checks um, on people. So for example, if you've ever signed up for Airbnb or Uber, like they typically do a background check where you send them a picture of your ID and then they go through and they scan and make sure you're not, you know, hitting all these marks that they don't want you to hit. So you can do the same thing and we'll implement the same thing for Flip as well, where you're allowed to like verify your profile and then we'll go through and we'll do a background check and we'll make sure that you're not somebody that's had a prior record of things that are not acceptable to connect with other people on our, you know, on terms on, on Flip online. And that's going to help people to feel a lot safer connecting with verified individuals. Um, and then on top of that, we'll have like a little bit of a rating as well. So if you get ghosted, which like totally sucks, you know, we'll ask you like, hey, did so-and-so show up? And then you can be like, no, and we can be like, all right, <laughs> like that's strike one and we'll reach out and kind of talk to them too. So we have a lot of things in the back end to just make sure that the app is being utilized properly by the people that are on it um, so that, you know, you don't end up being ghosted and catfished. And of course, there's other technologies that we're looking at implementing as well, just to keep the safety features up too. It's really important to feel safe when you're meeting up with people you don't really know in, in person. Yeah. Yeah, this is very important. And thanks for uh, laying all that out and really just determining, you know, Obviously, over time, you're going to improve the system, continue to build it smarter and take all those measures. So that's great. Um, let's walk through 
10 year vision. Let's go out there a ways. You know what, you know, we started with like, why is it important to, to help people connect? And um, where is this going? Where would you like to take this concept, this brand and this company over the next five, 10 years? Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, Flips Global, it's going to be everywhere. It's going to be the way that you connect with people in your local communities. It's also going to be the way that you connect to like your local health and wellness facilities as well. So we work with businesses um, in your areas, your gyms, your rock climbing centers, your scuba dive centers, etc. Um, so that you can connect with them. So you can create communities within these active spaces, you can find accountability buddies, um, you know, you can get in front of new members at the facility and find somebody to play tennis with to go rock climbing with. Um, so we plan on being in all of the gyms across the nation, we plan on being the way in which you connect with your coaches and your trainers. Um, we want to have these huge partnerships with some really big brands like Wilson and Nike. Like these are all goals that we can um, accomplish just by getting enough users and enough business on the app. Um, and we want to be the new way that you connect with people. If you're looking to go join a kickball game, you go and flip and you're like, oh, hey, someone needs a sub for a kickball game tonight. I'm going to go play. I'm going to meet some new people. I'm going to get some exercise. I'm going to go home. Um, and so that's that's really where we're going is we just want to be the new way that you actually get out and get active. That's really cool. That's really cool. And, you know, within this, um, definitely in the pitch, you mentioned around how you interact uh, economically, financially with uh, the health club industry and even just, you know, there will be others. But talk to us a little bit about the business model and then how you see, you know, economically still benefiting because in general, you know, people will be like, oh, you mean two people can you know, go meet outside? Well, that means that they're not going to be at the health club. Um, you know, making that health club money, but there's a fitness industry. There's a challenge that may, you might be able to describe. And then how do you see flip being able to help that? Yeah. So there's a couple of things. So first, like the big problem statement for the fitness industries is they're losing money. They're losing $13.8 billion a year because 50% of their members leave within the first six months. Like I personally have gotten many gym memberships and then didn't show up a month later, you know, and I probably am still paying those bills that I should definitely look at that. And I'm not there. And a lot of that is because of accountability or community. And it's never about timing. The gyms are open late. They're open on holidays. Like, you know, they're doing all these things that they can. And so what we're doing is giving the, giving these fitness facilities access to a low cost technology solution. That's going to allow them to help retain and engage with their members. So they can create these, these communities and these accountability buddies within there. So just because, you know, Nick, you and I met up on flip and we're going to go somewhere in Seattle doesn't mean that we will just automatically go hiking and not use a fitness facility. In fact, we might both belong to the same gym and we can be like, Hey, like, do you just want to go on a run or like help me lift weights or go on the treadmill or something like that? Because it's more of that accountability. Like if I'm going to meet up with my sister to go to the gym and she's like, I'm tired and be like, great see you later, girl. Like, I don't care. But if it's someone I don't really know, I'm going to have a much, much harder time flaking out on that person. And so you get this accountability buddy, and then you go to the gym and you use their services. You talk to their trainers, you buy their smoothies, you interact with the facility in whatever way that you can, and then you're, you're getting more into it. So we're providing all that to the businesses so that they can basically put $1 billion back into that market circle. Yeah, I, I really like that. And, you know, the, this is a challenge. Um, any any way that they can have access to uh, a, another system that um, has data that then also connects with people and you know you're you're gonna find what that alignment is I can I can see that and maybe that's for a further conversation for us as well but I think that's really interesting and I I, I really like that you're pointing at this angle to uh, have a strong benefit to the overall health and wellness ecosystem which I think is really really great. Um, as we move on here, uh, would love to hear a bit of your, you know, we're going to talk about lessons learned and advice to founders. And, um, you know, you've, you've gone, you've been going through this for a, a while now, and I'm sure that you, you know, we could spend three hours talking about this stuff, but, mm -hmm. um, what let's go with, let's go with two right now that maybe the way to say this is if you could tell this to your earlier founder self, um, what lessons have you learned up to this point that you'd like to share with earlier founders in their path 
that you're like, geez, I kind of wish someone knocked me on the shoulder and told me this right when I started? Oh man, there's so many lessons. <laughs> um, so definitely if you're a non-technical founder building a technical product, um, try really hard to find a technical person that you trust um, to help you work through it. It can be such a slog trying to just go through different development companies um, or competitions and trying to get ahead when you're not a tech founder. Um, definitely try and find somebody you trust. There are uh, question sheets, there's the Y Combinator founder matching platform. And just if there's anybody that you can find that can help you build it, um, really chat with them and get to know them on a personal level as well um, and set your terms up immediately because it's going to just help solve all future problems. Um, but that would be really, really helpful if someone was like, hey, I know that you want to go with this dev company because they're telling you it's a good price. But if you just waited a couple months and would talk to somebody else, like you might be able to get ahead. And like, I've burned so much money on just really horrible development teams um, that I wish somebody had just been like, how about we just pause for a second? Like you feel this need to just rush and get everything done. Um, but in the end, like if you do wait a minute and you ask good questions and you get feedback um, and you, you interview a bunch of people, you'll get ahead definitely further. So that's one thing if you're a non-technical founder, find technical help that you trust um, and everything's laid out like step-by-step step, exactly what you're going to get for exactly the amount of money or equity you're giving away and what the expectations are. Um, it's gonna save you a ton of trouble in the future. Um, other advice, am I looking for a second one too? Well, let's actually, let's stay there. Um, okay. I think that that's a really good thought. And, you know, this kind of falls into, you know, how to build your team and, you know, um, non-technical founder as well. And, you know, I think there's a two lot. proof points here that <laughs> you all that might not be technical or I'm not a developer, I don't know how to code, you can create things in the world, okay? And, and there are... Uh, amazing tools out there to get started and at least get things moving in the right direction. But then everything that Elizabeth just said, of course, I mean, that I, you know, I think what I would note on that is take your time, you know, I think rushed, mm -hmm. like trying to think that things are going to happen so quickly is um, going to lead to a lot of mistakes that maybe could be prevented. Um, but let's kind of shift to even, you know, how you chose to build your team, go off that a bit of piece of advice. So you know, you had this idea in individually, and then how did you initially go about finding, and you mentioned, you know, you were going down the road of technical teams and stuff, but you also have a co-founder. And how did you go about just starting that initial team that you now feel confident that as you move forward in this first, you know, this phase that you're, you're going to market with, how did you find your co-founders or build your initial team? Yeah. So um, initially I had a friend um, that I, I had met through other friends as well. And he happened to be a software engineer. And we got to talking and I was just like, I have this idea. I, like, I trust him. I, I know him. I know he's a really good guy. And I was like, would you just be able to like, throw some time at this and see like, if it's worth it, if it's something you want to do? Um, you know, and he was game. He was really like, he was down for the vision. I think that was really important is that we talked about the vision that I had. And I was just like, this is my like whole, this is the problem I'm trying to solve. This is my whole vision. This is the reason, like, what do you think? Like, am I crazy? And he was just like, no, like I run into that problem all the time. Um, so I knew that I wasn't alone. So having somebody that believed in the vision that I was working on that could help with the tech when I was able to find them was awesome and I could trust them. And so we have all that laid out. And then on the other hand, I have my other founder who came to me um, a little bit later, I actually, she's a, a friend of a friend and I went to her just for questions about social media. So she's like a social media guru. Um, she's been on YouTube forever. She's helped lots of influencers and celebrities get their YouTubes up and running and, and start their brands. And I was just like, Hey, Rachel, like, how do I do this? And when I was telling her about flip, she basically, instead of giving me advice was like, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna work with you on flip. Like I need this in my life. You know, her whole problem was the same thing. She graduated from college. She didn't have people she could meet to go play basketball with and, and do the activities that she liked. And she's like, I just so wish I had this, that I want other people that I know in my network to have this too. So like, let's build it. Um, and so with her, it was, you know, it was a lot of trust. It was like, I saw her work ethic. I knew that she'd worked for herself before, which is a big deal. Like she didn't really need a boss. 
Um, she just needed a little bit of like, this is what we're going for. And she's like, I got this. Um, and that's great. So having somebody you can collaborate with um, and just making sure that your founding team has to believe in the same vision that you do. And then they have to understand when you need to make pivots to get it to be what you need as well. Um, so always having that like, yeah, we want this goal, but we might need to kind of veer a little right to go back again to get there. Um, you know, they need to be open minded as well and in for it. They have to definitely be in for it. Yeah. And that really leads to, you know, one of our one of our last questions here in, to, in, in this area that, um, you know, steps to get started. And, you know, you you uh, as you had this initial idea, then you were, you know, you're like, OK, I'm, you, you start talking with people, which is so important. Everyone is like, don't keep your idea by to yourself. You need mm -hmm. to talk. You need to get feedback. It might end up to leading you to your co-founder, as we just heard. And and so um, so that's the things that you did. And then one key thing here I want to pull out that might be really helpful for others is just how how you went from like this idea in zero to actually getting started and then having something that people are now using and touching in the world. And if you could maybe summarize a bit of how you went about this to get that first version. I mean, you can save the details of like all the times with the dev team, but you know, is there yeah. any insight you can, you can share that like, cause again, there's a lot of people here and maybe attend founders live that are like, I, they might be working on something, they might have an idea, but it feels like the Grand Canyon to get to that initial product. Maybe it's an MVP, a minimum viable product in the market. Yeah, so I'm a very visual person. So for me, it was, you know, once I had, had the talk with, with my technical team, I was like, so this is doable. And they were like, yeah, like we could, you know, like no one hasn't built something never like this before. Like all the technology is there. It's just a matter of pulling the pieces together. Like, what would you want it to do? Like, what would you want it to, to, to work out? So I, I'm analytical and critic and creative at the same time. So I went into Excel because that's like my go-to platform. And I just started typing out line by line, all of the features that I wanted to happen. And then I wrote out a reason for that feature. So it was like chat because people have to talk to each other to connect. I mean, it was really basic stuff. And then it was like events so that we could do this events that connect to your Google calendar so that, you know, you didn't have to manage calendars and like all these things I wrote out. And then I walked through with them and I was like, these are what I think is the most important. And so then we kind of went back and forth talking about like, what is the most important? How long would it take to get there? Um, and I literally, I went into, I think I wasn't even in Figma at the time. I think I was probably in Canva and I just drew like little squares with other little squares in it. And I wrote profile and I wrote, you know, notification icon or something like that. So I had this like visual process of what I wanted some main screens to, to look like. And that's basically how I got started on what am I building? Here's this idea, but now let's break it down into like actual step by step. Like what would somebody experience while they're on it? That's really how we got started. That's great. And, you know, the great advice there again of just, um, you know, got to break it down into the pieces and, um, you know, what maybe one thing I would add or, you know, kind of step in here with there's you mentioned Figma and, and there's all these different things to pull together, to use, to take what's in your head and actually put a visual representation. That's probably the, one of the first starts is really the wireframes or, you know, you, there's there's there's, you know, applications now where you just put all these images together and they have these hotspots where you can touch and it's basically like there's the button and mm -hmm. the next thing. You, that that is uh, so important to be able to put in front of then development teams and any any software developer that is going to end up building it. They're like, oh, okay, and they're able to see that and and so all that. Then there's also just just to just to uh, leave people with is the whole you know no code or very low code things out there. There is a lot that we can accomplish now without having a full time development team on staff or paying hundreds of thousands of dollars to have this app made. So we would also encourage you to think about what can we do with the tools that we have available to us to get something in the hands of people to get feedback data and then movement forward. And you obviously you and your team did that. And you know, you, you pulled out Excel and just started to like type. That's a good start. Okay. 
obviously some you gotta start bare bones <laughs> you gotta start and, and i think that's the lesson here everyone is the um getting started and you know what happens this is what i did with founders live just got started we put on an event literally uh march of 2014 in seattle and lo and behold now we're all over the world and i think like my you know the advice you're hearing here is have a great idea test it with people get feedback but then get in motion right mm -hmm. get in Don't, motion and like so one of my big fears when i had first started like this bigger entrepreneurial journey was like i was so worried that somebody was going to steal my idea like i was just so for some reason the market like tells us don't tell people what you're working on because they're totally going to take it from you. And so people end up holding and like hoarding these ideas. And once you start actually putting it out there, um, read a book, it's called the mom test. It's a great book. It's a super short read, but it is literally the way that you ask people is my idea valid. Is this something that you would use? Is this something so you could see someone using and like asking those questions and getting the feedback early on is really great to know if you're like, going to actually dive in or if you need to do a little bit more work on your idea and people like yes i'm sure people do steal your idea for the most part though people really don't steal your idea it's yours you're the only one with the true vision here and investors they're going to invest in you as a person that's going to actually drive the business and be able to bring this to market if someone steals it they're probably not going to do a good job at bringing it to market the same way that you had because you can actually do it and you have the real vision for it so like just don't be afraid to get started and ask questions because otherwise it's never going to happen yeah there you go. That's exactly what I was going to touch on to but you, 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 you talked about it. You know, you heard that passion there. You heard that, Hey, an idea is out there, but they can't steal your passion and your insight and your mm -hmm. unique angle. So, um, there you go. Well, so, um, if people want to go learn more and they want to find it, um, so go flip app.com. Yes. Yep, that's it. Goflipapp.com. Check us out. Join our waitlist. Beta, um, public beta is coming up pretty soon. So we'll get everybody else on the app, hopefully in a few weeks here. And we'll see you on Flip. All right. And Elizabeth Arnold, it was so great to chat with you. Again, congratulations on being the one, the winner of Yay. Founders Live Primetime 2023. I can tell you right now, thousands and thousands of startups out there and um, you emerged at the top. And I think that's really important to know that very good indications, hey, it's just one thing, but it's an indication of the direction that you're heading and you, you take that momentum and build up on it. But congratulations again, and it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Awesome, thanks so much, Nick, it's been great. All right, everyone, thank you. Uh, it's been fun to chat today on this Founders Live Conversations. I'm Nick Hughes, I'm the founder and CEO of Founders Live, and you've heard it today. Um, great excitement, um, great story of entrepreneurship, and we're excited to hear from more things from Elizabeth and her flip team soon. So thank you all. Uh, that's it for today, and we will see you later.